Elizabeth I is remembered as one of the greatest monarchs that England ever had. During her reign, there was a golden age across her country, with huge developments in literature and culture. She was even the queen who, against all the odds, managed to see off the Spanish Armada, which won over her critics. She was seen as a queen who was married to her country, and who was not afraid to make tough decisions. However, because of her commitment to England, the queen never married. This caused an issue in the final years of her life, as there was uncertainty as to who would become the next ruler of England. She had ordered and given permission for the woman many deemed to be her rightful successor, Mary Queen of Scots, to be executed following many plots to Elizabeth's life. So who would become the successor? However, today, we look at the painful death of Queen Elizabeth I, and remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. During the Tudor period, medical knowledge and treatments were not amazing. There was a reliance still on apothecaries, and also medieval remedies such as bleeding and purging. Many blamed serious pestilences and outbreaks of disease on God, as there was a link drawn between ill health and religion, as it was believed the victim had been sinning. During Elizabeth's reign, she was ill a number of times, in particular she suffered from smallpox, which in itself was deadly and painful, which caused the Queen to have scars on her face. These were a great worry to the Queen, as once she recovered, she was concerned about her beauty, and even ordered painters to ensure that the portraits of the Queen were free from the scars. As she aged, her image changed over time, and as she was previously described as eternally youthful, this did change. Portraits were painted to make her look younger, and ambassadors noted how, her teeth are very yellow and unequal, many of them are missing, so that one cannot understand her easily when she speaks quickly. Elizabeth reigned for almost 45 years, and was a final Tudor monarch, but during her final years her health over time deteriorated, and many of her close friends and allies passed away. She began to suffer from bouts of what we would call today depression, and in 1590, one of her closest ladies-in-waiting, Blanche Parry, died. She was the chief gentlewoman of the Queen's Privy Chamber and the keeper of the Queen's jewels. Elizabeth had known her since she was just a child, and she was one of her best attendants. Blanche Parry was treated as a baroness and was given land for her service, and her death hit Elizabeth hard. In 1598, another one of her closest advisers and friends, Sir William Cecil, passed away. He had been by Elizabeth's side during the tough times, and remained a staunch supporter of her, even since her youth. These deaths hit Elizabeth very hard, and she was devastated after them. She began to become more reclusive, but in her final years she acted still as a figure of power. She had overseen the execution of her former favourite Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. At one time many people believed he could possibly marry the Queen, despite the age gap, but Devereux had been convicted of high treason, and was deemed a traitor for planning a rebellion that would have resulted in Elizabeth I being seized. In January 1603, Elizabeth was noted to have been unwell and in poor mood, and she retired to Richmond Palace, one of her favourite residences. Richmond was chosen as it was where the Queen felt most comfortable, and during her final months, she surrounded herself with her most loyal ladies and attendants. During this time, Elizabeth began to shun food and drink, and she lost a significant degree of weight, not eating what she needed to. This led to her ladies becoming very worried about her, and they tried to get doctors to see her, but Elizabeth refused to be seen. Another death of a close lady, Catherine Howard, plunged Elizabeth's depression deeper, as Howard had served her for 45 years, and died very suddenly. It's thought that this was a straw that broke the camel's back, with regards to her mental health, and Elizabeth, it was said, loved the Countess well, and hath much lamented her death, remaining ever since in a deep melancholy, that she must seemingly be overtaken. By February 1603, Elizabeth remained in a deep depression, and she was a shadow of her former self. There was a sharp departure from her days, in which she rallied and inspired sailors and soldiers at Tilbury Dock, looking like the goddess Athena, when she issued her war cry to defend England against the Spanish Armada. The Queen, who was a sign of virtue and strength 
at that point was no longer, and Elizabeth, almost 70, was frail and depressed. She remained being stubborn and refused to rest during her time at court. The Queen's ladies-in-waiting worried so much about her frailty that they put pillows over the floor of her bedchamber in case she fell over and injured herself. Further deaths of Catherine Carey, the Countess of Nottingham, and her close friend, Lady Nollies, hit her hard. In her final days, the Queen was rather upset and became distressed, and in March she fell sick and remained in a settled and unremovable melancholy. She was known to just sit on cushions for hours on end, motionless in deep thought. It's believed that in these episodes, she may have been debating her life and the mistakes she had made, and also what she had done with regards to the executions she had ordered. She may have even been contemplating her deep regret over ordering the execution of her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, whom it's believed could have succeeded her at one point. The Queen never really wanted to execute Mary, but was convinced to do so by her counsellors, and she regretted it deeply. It was said that the Queen sheds many tears and sighs, maintaining her innocence, that she never gave consent to the death of that Queen. Elizabeth, it's said, began to become visited by ghostly episodes of people she had known, including Mary, and others who had passed away. It was clear, though, that Elizabeth was dying. Coupled with her depressed state of mind and her delirium, her health began to fail. She made the decision to retire to bed in March, and the Archbishop of Canterbury was summoned to come to her bedside and to pray for her soul. He informed the Queen that she would go to heaven, and that she would be looked after. On the 24th of March, 1603, Elizabeth I passed away at Richmond Palace. Her body was then taken to Whitehall, where it was held in state, before her funeral occurred. She made it clear before her death that she did not wish to be disemboweled, but this was not adhered to, as Robert Cecil left it up to the doctors to do so, and the Queen was embalmed, with her body encased in a lead-lined wooden coffin. Every night, six ladies watched over the coffin, but during this period, it was said that there was a loud crack from the coffin, as her body and head broke open from the various gases released as the corpse rotted. The explosion of her body, it said, was so big that it splintered some of the wood, and it was even said to have been worse if she had not been disemboweled. Elizabeth's funeral took place on the 28th of April, 1603, and she was buried inside of Westminster Abbey. There was a huge number who were involved in the procession, and there were thousands of members of the public who came to witness her body making its final journey. It was said there was such a general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the light had never been seen or known in memory of man. It was clear that the people of her country greatly loved their queen, and she was held in high regard. Elizabeth was a monarch who had seen a huge amount of change in her time, and had aimed to restore normality and calm, following some of the turmoil and turbulence of the previous kings and queens. She tried her best to unite Catholics and Protestants under her religious settlements, but in her final days she became incredibly distressed and depressed, with the loss of some of her closest friends. She lamented her reign and some of the decisions she took, and these stayed with her until her final moments. Elizabeth I is considered today to have been one of the greatest queens in history. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.